Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we've got another episode of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights, right after the last one, because I'm feeling quite generous. Um, so today we've got part 54, uh, I've already got part 64, so 10 more parts to go until uh, I've caught up with everything, but um, anyway, uh, we've got a very special one today, I think, well I say that every day, but we've got some really cool animals today, we've got a couple of extinct animals, uh, a couple of endangered animals, and a really interesting mix of animals today, so I'm really excited to go through them. So we're going to be starting today with uh, fish. Uh, by Leaf and Buffsu. We can see if we can find them. We have got the Striped Bass. These wonderful guys over here. So, the Striped Bass, also known as the Atlantic Striped Bass, the Striper, the Line Cider, the Rock, or the Rockfish, they're an Anadronus species of fish that are found primarily along the Atlantic coast and they also have been widely introduced into a lot of areas inside the US for sports uh, fishing and recreational fishing and things like that. And um, they've actually become the state fish of a lot of places such as Maryland, Rhode Island and California. And the marine fish of New York, New Jersey, Virginia and New Hampshire. So these guys are kind of a uh, typical member of that group, the Monoridae in their shape, they're not too dissimilar. But they have these long stripes that go down their body where they get their name striped bass and you can see there's definitely one going down their lateral line and i think this guy came out really really well i really love seeing the fishes buff Sue's definitely the uh, good fish guy so the common mature size for these guys is about 20 to 40 pounds or about 9 to 18 kilograms with a larger specimen recorded about 124 pounds or 56 kilos that was netted in 1896 and striped bass are believed to be quite long-lived, living for about 30 years, and their average size is, uh, length is about 20 to 35 inches, or 50 to 90 centimeters, and approximately uh, 5 to 20 pounds, or 5 to 9 kilos. So the natural distribution is all across the Atlantic coastline from North America, from the St. Lawrence River in the Gulf of Mexico uh, to Louisiana, and they're an anadronous fish, that means they migrate between salt and freshwater, and it's quite similar to salmon. Salmon's a really good example. These guys will spawn in fresh water and then obviously the babies come out in fresh, uh, out of the rivers and into the ocean and that's where they grow up and live most of their lives until it's their turn to go up and spawn again. Uh, similar to salmon and things like that. But as I mentioned, they've also been uh, reintroduced uh, to a lots of places inside uh, uh, the US and also outside the US such as Iran, Russia, South Africa and Turkey for um, aquaculture and sports fishing but luckily they often really aren't too detrimental to their ecosystem so that's good. So in terms of life cycle they spawn in fresh water and although, and although they've been uh, sufficiently adapted to this freshwater habitat they spend most of their uh, adult lives out in the sea or out in the salt water and um, they can kind of live in um, fresh water but that's kind of where they go out to live their normal life. Uh, there are a few populations of spawning bass that are found in fresh water, but overall they kind of like to go out and live in the sea. Uh, mainly landlocked populations or populations that are in aquaculture, but are still really, really cool animals. So, they are kind of, since they are a, a sport fish, they are very heavily managed. So, the population has declined from less than 5 million uh, by eight, uh, 1982, so their population has decreased from fishing. And... Um, Efforts to fishermen to throw back lengths and smaller striped bass and manager pans have actually been going pretty well. So a lot of the bringing back the stock has been going pretty well. And as of 2007, a nearly 60, uh, 56 million fish are included of all ages. And it's believed that they've caught about uh, 3 or 4 million per year. So the population is quite healthy and is well managed. So that's always really, really good. Really cool to see that. And in terms of food, they are a common food fish. Uh, they have a white meat with like a mild flavor and medium taste. And they can be pretty much uh, cooked anyway. Um, grilled, pan seared, steamed or poached or roasted or deep fried. And um, apparently they do pretty well as fish uh, feed. I've obviously never had one because I don't really live in the areas where they have them. But I do like fish and I imagine this would be quite a yummy fish to eat. Especially like um, sea fish and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, really, really cool fish. Um, really cool to see this guy in the game. It really adds to a lot to the diversity of the fishing uh, with mods, especially from good old Buffsu, who doesn't love Buffsu. And I keep getting this bloody notification for this Quinaco, but that's a spoiler. 
So that was done by Leaf and Buffsu. Uh, next one was done by Mega Rex Gaming and Genora Pizza. We have got the Desert Monitor. So we've got a reptile this time. Really, really cool guy here. Look at that. Sitting next to his poo. So the Desert Monitor is a species of monitor lizard that is found all throughout North Africa, all through Central and South Asia as well. And uh, obviously carnivorous, so they feed on a wide variety of vertebrates and invertebrates. So you can see they're normally about uh, these kind of colors. They're quite light colors, like like yeah, brown and yellow to gray, typically. And they average at about one meter long, but they can get up to two meters. So they're not the smallest of lizards, but not absolutely gigantic. And they also have these horizontal bands going down their tail as well that they may lose if they mature, but sometimes it, it doesn't happen. Um, they're also overall body size is dependent on a lot of factors, such as uh, the available food supply, the time of year and their state of reproduction with males in general being larger and more heavier than the females uh, but females are typically more gentle and uh, and also they can go through periods of molting where they will shed their outer layer of skin uh, that happens to a lot of uh, lizards and snakes and it happens about three times a year and they're quite well adapted to the environments that they live in because they are obviously a desert monitor so they live typically in deserts uh, like the sahara desert and some central uh, asian deserts but uh, they can very good swimmers and divers and be known to dive in water when they can to hunt for food. Monitors in general tend to be very good swimmers. There's believed to be about three subspecies described. I won't go into too details about them, but uh, mainly the difference is kind of difference in scales and stuff and things like that. And um, there is the three subspecies are the Grey monitor, monitor, the Caspian Monitor, and the Indian Desert Monitor. That kind of tells you where they're from. Not too much difference between them anyway. And they typically go into hibernation from September to April. And um, they become uh, more active during May and July. But during the middle of the day, they may stay in their bur uh, burrows and only come out during the day for search of food and things. Look at these wonderful little guys. How can you not love them? And... Uh, like other lizards, they are typically uh, endothermic, so that means they rely on the outside environment to get their body heat. So what they'll do is that they'll use um, kind of bask and things like that to try and bring their body temperatures up correctly. And they typically um, kind of have this typical running speed uh, of their body is kind of between 21 and 37 degrees. And between these temperatures, their uh, speed will increase, they get a little bit more um, activation from their muscles. It's just kind of how their body works, so I think it's really interesting. And um, it often depends, their, in general, kind of depends on their outdoor environment. Uh, but uh, often they can, that's why they like to stay in their burrows sometimes, since it's more um, consistent in their burrows temperatures normally, rather than going outside. Uh, but they will uh, often go out, begin bask in the morning, and reach the highest point in the noonday and heat. And then they kind of just hang around and then just do these things. But their maximum body temperature does not get above 38.5 degrees. With male monitors generally having a much higher, or a little bit higher, uh, active and uh, body temperatures than females. And when they hibernate, it, this typically slows down to about 15 to... Uh, 30 degrees Celsius, but in many areas during hibernation, it can be 16 to 18. So they slow their bodies down during brumation to really help them uh, sleep. And in terms of reproduction, they are uh, normally uh, kind of takes place between May and July. And copulation occurs between May and June. And they normally lay their eggs uh, from the later part of June to the beginning of July. And the eggs are incubated about 29 to 31 degrees Celsius. And they hatch after about 120 days. And at birth, the baby lizards that you get out are probably about 25 centimeters in length. Um, and like most members of Varanus or most other species of monitor lizards, they are carnivores, so they feed on all sorts of different things, such as mice, eggs, fish, but also smaller mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects, and invertebrates, if that opportunity presents itself. And like other monitors, they are venomous, so they have a very, very... Um, not very potent venom, but they had like these venom glands in their jaws. It was often thought with the Komodo dragon, it was like a bacteria, but it's actually a small amount of venom that they will inject into their prey. And uh, it can be used as a defense mechanism, also defend off predators as well, to help digest food 
and help in capturing and killing prey potentially. And luckily they are considered uh, least concern. They're quite common around their habitat, but there is uh, on occasion uh, some issues in some areas because of their over to top collection because they're often collected for both their skins and also for pets like the pet trade because people like these lizards but they are the trade is prohibited in northern africa central asia and punch of uh, parts of india though the species in some areas is still unprotected but they are considered least concerns so they are not in danger of going extinct anytime soon and in terms of captivity they typically only uh, live a few years of captivity but when they can do well, they often live up to about 17 years, although they're never docile. Not really the best pets, but a lot of people uh, like monitors as pets anyway. And in terms of their distribution, they can be found across Morocco, to Egypt, to Israel, to Iraq, and then into northwestern India. So they have quite a big range uh, for a reptile. Uh, quite common uh, in the areas. They kind of live all that desert from North Africa into Central Asia, then into... Uh, South Asia as well and to India So yeah, really cool little lizards done by Mega Gaming Rex and Genora Pizza And the next one was just done by Leaf. Uh, we've got a mammal this time One that's telling me that she's pregnant, but she won't give birth because I don't allow it um, We have got the Guanaco Wonderful little guy here. Well, not little. They're quite big. Um, these guys are a wild camelid uh, native to South America and are closely related to llamas and one of the two species of south uh, american camelid along with the venienza um these guys stand at about a meter tall the 1.3 meters uh so three foot to four foot three at the inch uh, at the shoulder and their body length tip typically is about 2.1 to 2.2 meters or six to se six foot 11 or seven foot three inches and weigh between 90 and 140 kilograms or 200 310 pounds their color uh, varies very little compared to domestic llamas. Uh, they typically like a light brown with a dark cinnamon or something like that with uh, light stomachs, uh, like white underneath around here, as you can see, and also kind of white faces. And then they have gray faces with these uh, small straight ears that you can see here. They're not they're too dis the distant, uh, too different from llamas. They also one of the largest terrestrial mammals in uh, South America. And other types of megafauna that they can be found with or kind of live in South America is also tapirs, marsh deer, white-tailed deer, spectacled bears, and jaguars. And you can see they're pop um, they've got these quite thick uh, skin around their necks and quite um, uh, thick fur, which is found in their both their wild and domestic relatives. That protect their necks from attacks and also they've been used their neck skins to make shoelaces and um, we're the only place that they're illegally allowed to be hunters in Chile uh, and there's only population classes endangered and there was about 13,200 uh, uh, Guanacos legally hunted from that area between 2007 and 2012 they don't there just doesn't seem to be a big demand for hunting but in terms of food, they're like all camels and other camelids, they typically are herbivores, so they feed on grasses, shrubs, herbs, lichens, flowers, and stuff. And their food is swallowed with little chewing and it first enters their fore stomach, where they will be finally digested after rumination. And it's quite similar to ruminants, though they're not that closely related to uh, other ruminants. And their digestive system is likely to actually evolve independently from ruminants, so it shows that it's a very useful system for digesting plants. So, also being quite an alpine species, they typically live in higher altitudes, uh, altitudes about 4,000 meters above sea level, except in Pat Patagonia. They typically have high amounts of red blood cells with lots of hemoglobin, which allows them to better um, grab oxygen and transport it around the body. And in terms of their populations, they're typically found in steppes, scrublands, and mountainous areas in South America, where they be can be found in places like Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Patagonia. And a small population lives in Paraguay, and uh, the most numerous populations tend to be in Argentina. And the estimated populations, as of 60, 2016, is believed to be about 2 million animals, uh, uh, 2 million animals uh, generally, with most of them living in Argentina, and a few hundred thousand uh, living in Chile, 300,000 in Peru, 200 in Bolivia, and 20 to 100 in Paraguay. And um, yeah, they seem to be doing quite well in those areas. Might need some reintroductions or just not enough habitat for them, really. 
Uh, Guanaco is these living herds of kind of uh, females with their young and a dominant male. And bachelor males will often form their own herds. Uh, we'll have a look at the babies we'll talk about that. Form their own herds that can be up to uh, no more than 10 adults while these reproductive groups. But when bachelor herds, they can get as big as many as 50 males. And they're quite good runners. So they can run up to 56 kilometers per hour, 35 miles per hour, over rocky terrain and are excellent swimmers. And for the typical lifespan is about 20 to 25 years. So as I mentioned, the kind of ecology, they live in small herds and quite fast runners. Uh, their natural predators includes the Andean fox and the puma, where they often get hunted by them. And um, during the mating season, which is typically between November and February, the males will often fight violently for each other in breeding rights. And about 11 and a half months later, you get this cute little babies uh, born. I think it's called a Kulilingo. And they're able to walk like other... Um, uh, ungulates and camelids they are able to walk right up from birth and uh males are chased off from the dominant uh herd by the dominant male at about a year old while the females typically tend to stay and general really really cool animals uh they're believed to be the ancestor of the llama as i mentioned and one of the cool to be domesticated and all that really really cool bunch of animals i like guanacos i think they're so cool uh really cool to see them in game and leafy did always do, as always you do a good job of them so next we're going to move on to a mod from Narwhala. Uh, everyone loves Narwhala, does a wonderful job. We have got this wonderful fellow here, the Spanish Ibex, also known as the Iperian Ibex or the Spanish Wild Goat. There are species of uh, Ibex that is only found in the Iberian Peninsula and there's been four subspecies described, uh, which two are now extinct, with the Portuguese subspecies becoming extinct in 1892 and the Pinean Ibex becoming extinct in 2000. And there was actually a cloning program, I believe this is, this is the first, the extinction technically, uh, to try and clone the Pinean subspecies that revolt, uh, resulted in a, car, a kid being born in July yeah. 2003. But the clone died from um, a few minutes after because of physical defects in its lungs. I believe that's unrelated to the cloning process. It was just uh, some of the things that happen with babies, sometimes they just don't develop properly and it died and therefore kind of uh, went extinct twice. So that's probably not the best way to go. <laughs> but um, you can see they're quite large and flexible, uh, the, especially these hooves and short legs, which is used to uh, climb around um, rock faces and stuff that they're adapted to. And the horns of these uh, Iberian Ibex kind of curve down like that and um, it depends on the subspecies there's some variation there that's how they're kind of described and the annual horn, horn growth tends to be de uh, determined by age but also can be contributed by environmental factors and um, the other growth things like that and um, the Iberian Ibex as you can see here shows extreme sexual dimorphism you can see that's the female there yeah, this is a female. You can see the female is a lot much smaller with much smaller horns than that than compared to the male. And um, the males are much larger in weight and size and have larger horns. And the bones uh, of uh, female ibex actually ossify or turn into bone rather than calcium. Uh, uh. Um, not calcium, uh, cartilage. Uh, nearly two years before the male does. So that gives them more time to grow. So as I mentioned, the population uh, really only lives about the Iberian Peninsula within these four different subspecies and actually have been extirpated from Gibraltar and, and possibly Andorra, uh, sadly. But um, they seem to be making a comeback since they consider considered least concern. Uh, they're generally a mixed feeder. They're kind of between a browser and a grazer. So they pretty much eat whatever they can find, they're like much goats, um, like other goats. And the percentage of each type of resource can vary depending on their where they live, their season, and the altitude. And um, the highest uh, body storage of kidney fat can be found during the productive warm seasons and lowest during the cold periods. So they kind of get fat during the warm seasons. Um, and foraging entirely depends on the season. They forage uh, tend to... Uh, Reduce their movements around when foraging in winter. However, uh, during the spring where there's more food, they kind of run out and do their own things and much more active. Uh, and in terms of their reproduction, they kind of live in these two groups. There's uh, male-only groups with females and young juveniles. And during the rutting season, which is about November, December, 
the males will interact with the females in order to reproduce. And um, they kind of rot with each other and fight each other to try and protect a group of females. And they kind of um, try to avoid that. They just try and rot and fight each other. And mixed groups are also common during the rest of winter. And during the birth season, a yearling is kind of separated from uh, the female groups by the time of their birth. And the males are the first to separate and return to these male-only groups, while the female yearlings will eventually return to their mothers and spend the next few years within these social groups. And in terms of the predatory response, they have quite a unique way of signaling um, others of potential predators uh, where they've been spotted. The ibex will have an erect posture with its ears and its head pointing up in the direction of the potential predator. The caller will then signal the other ibex of the group with more alarm calls. And um, once the group has heard that, they will flee in the other direction and try and get to like a rocky slope or something to try and protect themselves, which is very, very interesting. And uh, these populations, sadly, have decreased a lot over these last few centuries due to lots of hunting pressures. Oh, we'll have a look at the kids while we're talking about them. Look at these little kids. How cute. We'll talk about how they've gone, uh, nearly gone extinct while we talk about the cute kids. But um, due to a lot of things such as hunting pressures, agriculture development, and habitat degradation, uh, their kind of populations has been going down and down and down. In about 1890, as I mentioned, the Portuguese ibex became extinct. And by the mid-19th century, another one had lost most of its range, the Pinarian ibex, which became extinct in uh, January 2003. There's also a bunch of uh, threats believed to be affecting their future survival, such as competition with domestic livestock and other ungulates, uh, disturbance from uh, human hunting and tourism. Uh, recently, there have been found that they have been exposed to these outbreaks that come from domestic animals, and uh, it limits the reproduction success of these individuals and usually affects these males and females. And also scabies has become a major destabilizing factor in these many populations. So it's kind of a, rock, a rocky road, but they are doing okay now. They are considered least concern. So they aren't in immediate danger of extinction, luckily. And let's just have a look at these wonderful males. Now, Wala really knocks it out with these monsters. It's really cool to see these cool ibex. Really did a great job. So next, we'll be moving on to uh, back to some birds. So we have got the Mangelic Penguin now uh, by Leaf and Nicholas Lionrider. Nicholas Lionrider and his wonderful penguins. Look at these wonderful guys here. Uh, so let's uh, see that. So the Mangelic Penguin is a South American penguin that breeds around the coasts of Patagonia. That includes Argentina, um, Chile, and the Falkland Islands, with some occasionally migrating to Brazil and Uruguay. And they are a vagrant species, so they've been found in lots of really weird locations, such as El, Sal El Salvador, the Avian Islands in Antarctica, Australia, and there's even been some vagrants recorded in New Zealand. And one of the most numerous of the uh, Sphinicurus genus of penguins, and their nearest relatives to uh, the African penguin, the Humboldt penguin, and the Galapagos penguin. The name comes from the uh, Portuguese uh, explorer Ferdinand Magellan, where they get the name the Mangelic Penguin. Uh, this species is also listed least concerned, so they're not in immediate danger of extinction. So in terms of their size, they're kind of a medium-sized penguin at about 61 to 76 centimeters, or 24 to 30 inches tall, and weigh between 2.7 and 6.5 kilograms, or 6 to 14 pounds, with males being on average larger than the females. With their weight drop uh, while the parents are very young, they tend to get a bit um, leaner because they're feeding their baby. As you can see, the adults have a black ba uh, black backs and white um, abdomens, kind of like with counter shading. And they have these two bands under their chest here. And um, the head is black, as you can see, with like this little pink ear as well. Um, it's kind of the easiest way to tell the part they have these two bands here. That's the easiest way to tell an angelic penguin from other species of penguins. And they're actually quite long-lived. They can live up to 24 uh, five years in the wild, but up to 30 in captivity. And um, these young birds, let's have a look at the young birds. They can have quite a splotch appearance, as you can see here, uh, especially on their feet. That fades when it grows into adulthood, uh, one that usually becomes black. And um, in terms of diet, their diet is not too insanely just... Uh, let me see if I can find a swimming one. There we are. No, that's not what we wanted. That's not what we wanted. I want to see one swimming. So in terms of their diet, it's not too dissimilar from other penguins. They typically eat a lot of cuttlefish, crustaceans, squids, and krill. Uh, 
where they use their salt um, excreting gland to get rid of the salt from their bodies. They're also, uh, you typically dive to depths. They're not the deepest diving penguin, but they are uh, quite a deep diver. They get dive between 20 and 50 meters to find prey. And during the breeding season, males and females have similar foraging and dying patterns. However, their bone tissue analogies suggest that they their diets diverge post-season when their limitations are posed on chick rearing are removed so their diets do change um, they also do not experience a shortage of food like the galapagos penguin does because they have a constant supply of food located around the atlantic coast of south america and jellyfish are often actually sought out specifically in the genus chinera and chromosona uh, typically uh, quite commonly sought out as, but uh, which had previously been thought that they've been accidentally um, ingested rather than sought out. And similar preferences actually have been found in the Adelaide penguin, the yellow-eyed penguin, and the little penguin. So these guys uh, travel in large flocks when hunting for food, and in the breeding season they have these large nesting colonies, similar to other penguins, but these live in areas such as Argentina, southern Chile, and the Falkland Islands. They typically have a density of like 20 nests per 100 meters, so they're quite densely packed in there. And um, typically these breeding colonies are established in February and extends to late February and March when the chicks are mature enough to leave the colonies. Uh, two eggs are typically laid. Oh, we'll have a look at the babies while we're talking about them. Uh, two eggs are typically laid at about... Um, an incubation takes about 39 to 42 days where the parents uh, share like 10, 15 day shift where the chicks are cared for by both parents for 29 days and fed every two or three days. Normally both are raised throughout adulthood, though occasionally only one chick is raised. Uh, and um, the males and females will take turns um, hatching and then forage uh, kind of all the time. So that, uh, usually about every 10 to 15 days they'll swap places and kind of take care of each other, which is really, really cool. And once the breeding season is complete, they will migrate north for the winter, where they usually feed in places like Peru and Brazil. And luckily they are considered least concerned, but there are some um, serious uh, issues that they can face, such as oil spills uh, that can really hurt them, um, uh, very vulnerable to that, uh, which could actually kill uh, 20,000 adults and 22,000 juveniles each year off the coast of Argentina with oil spills. And often they're exposed to infections and uh, things like that. It can really hurt the population. Another big issue is climate change with... Um, they have to swim further to get to suitable breeding grounds because it's getting the world is getting a little bit warmer. Uh, mass mortality is also a big issue, but luckily they are considered uh, least concerned, and their populations are protected, and they're trying to increase the prey availability and also uh, success for breeding for these guys. So there is some efforts to try and help protect them as well. So it's really really cool to see that happening. So that's the Mangelic Penguin for you. So now we're going to be moving on uh, by this mod. This is done by Leaf and Nicholas Lionrider, just to make sure they get the credit they deserve. We're going back in time a little bit. Uh, we have got Xyphactinus. Uh, so a really, really cool big fish here. So they're all in the water here. Have a look at you, big boy. So this was done by Leaf and Buffsu, uh, obviously the fish expert here. So Xyphactinus, which names for Latin and Greek means sword brain, they're a genus of large extinct fish. They can get up to about 5 meters long or about 16 feet. They're a predatory marine bony fish that live during the late Cretaceous from the Ab Albion to the Maastrichtian. Uh, and they often look like a giant fang tarpan, though they're not that closely related. And um, these guys are very, very big and voracious. There's actually a specimen that has been found with a 13-foot fish, uh, and I think a 6-foot fish actually, um, Gilla securus, in its mouth. And um, that's believed to be the reason it died. So they're very, very voracious predators, it seems. And um, I think that's really, really cool about them. They also, uh, we actually know virtually nothing about their um, juvenile stages. There's the smallest fossil is about 12 inches or 30 centimeters long. So we don't know how they look like as really small juveniles. And like other, other species, uh, a lot of these remains have been found uh, within uh, sharks as well. There actually has been the remains of a Cyphactinus found within a Catoxy rhino, which was like the Cretaceous version of a great white shark. And, is a, and this specimen is actually at display in the Kansas Museum of Natural History, which is pretty cool. 
And being such a large animal, they would be like swimming around, hunting whatever they get the mouths around. They typically live in the Western Interior Seaway, which is a big seaway that used to exist in the middle of America, kind of a split America in two. And it was a shallow sea with lots of large animals, especially large marine reptiles, large fish and sharks and things used to live in. Though there are some remains that have been found in Europe, Australia, um, Canada, Venezuela, and Argentina, so they seem to be pretty much a global species. But the most uh, famous specimens always come from like Kansas and the Nebraska Chalk, and uh, specifically around like the east coast of the United States. Um, really, really cool guys here. Um, they typically lived with animals like uh, I'm trying to think, um, Hesperornis, which was like a early version of a penguin, though they're not closely related at all. Uh, lots of plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and uh, very very diverse ecosystems within the Western Terry Seaway also pterosaurs like Pteranodon and probably ate all of them too it was pretty a voracious predator as that fossil as I mentioned shows so it's very likely they just ate whatever they could get their mouths around so really really cool species if I do say so myself and yeah really really cool animals it's cool to see them in uh, Planet Zoo I already covered this guy in Jurassic World Evolution, I believe. It's the same model, but it's cool to see it in a place where we can create much better aquariums. But yeah. So now we get another extinct animal. I know you guys love your extinct animals. We have got this next one done by TNT, coming back for a really nice mod. We have got the Inner Mongolia Cetacosaurus, which is the species what? itself, is Cetacosaurus neo-mongoliensis, which I'll explain later, but... We'll talk about Cetacosaurus. These guys are a genus of early Ceratopsian dinosaur from the early Cretaceous that's believed to live from 126 to 101 million years ago. And it's also one of the most rich um, dinosaur genera in terms of species, with about 12 species described. Though that is could possibly be split, but we don't, uh, we're don't. we not going to get into the exact taxonomy here. We're going to look at this wonderful male. Uh, up to 12 species are known, found from China, Mongolia, Siberia, and possibly Thailand. And these guys are typically, all the species are typically quite robust, especially in the head, but, but they walk around on two legs and they have quite robust beaks and things like that. And one individual is actually found with these quills. Uh, I don't think this species has been just, uh, assigned to a certain um, species, but we know that they had quills that showed that um, they actually had um, feathers, believe it or not, or quills. So that really sparks the debates of what dinosaurs had feathers and things. And these guys actually have pretty large um, brains for their size. So it's believed that they could potentially have quite complex behaviors, but obviously brain size doesn't really determine complex behaviors. There are a lot of insects with very complex behaviors. And it's also believed that they may have had a well-developed uh, sense of smell and vision. Um, so that means they had well-developed senses that they may have come out uh, during the times of day. So they, we don't really know too much about that, but I think it's really interesting. And these guys are also one of the earliest Ceratopsians, uh, so, but they're closer to Triceratops and Tan uh, Yinlong. Uh, so they are closer to things like Triceratops and those bigger, later Ceratopsians. Uh, they're often uh, considered to be like a really early versions of those. And they're actually one of the more completely known dinosaur genera. They're quite well known. There's lots of individuals from lots of different species, including like nearly complete specimens. Uh, also, hatchlings and adults are represented, so we have a pretty good idea of their growth range. And there's been pretty uh, detailed studies on their growth and reproductive biologies. And the genus itself was first described in 1923 with Henry uh, Fairfield Osborne. And the type species itself is uh, Cetacosaurus mongoliensis. But they have, as I mentioned, like 11 other species described since then. The species that we're talking about here, it's called the, this kind of given the scientific name, or the common name, I mean, the Inner Mongolian uh, Cetacosaurus. This particular species is Neon Mongoliensis, which was described by Dane Russell and Zhao in 1996. And it was named uh, Neon Mongoliensis after the Mandarin Chinese name for Inner Mongolia. So it's a Neo-Mongolia kind of, uh, and it's based on a nearly complete specimen that includes most of its skull. So you can see the skull is quite well represented, but this is the male. We'll have a talk about the females. Really, really beautiful female here. And uh, is also found in the early Cretaceous in Hilo formation with several individuals, so it is quite well known. And they named this, also named another species found in this, but they've often kind of been lumped. Um, the other specimens are likely related to another species, um, Orondonensis, but that's most likely kind of lumped into Neo-Mongoliensis, which is kind of uh, indefensible because they're only 
quite fragmentary and is always quite similar to Neo Mongoliensis. But yeah, really, really cool animal here. One of the many um, species uh, <laughs> of uh, uh, Cetacosaurus. Though it, there have been talks about splitting them into the gender and things like that, but I think this is a really cool guy. So this kind of was like a mid-level animal. There is evidence that they potentially would have been quite good diggers uh, from other species. Uh, also, uh, we have lots of hatchlings from them, and we have pretty good idea of their colors. The specimen that I mentioned before is kind of like a reddish uh, or orange and black and kind of really nice colors. I think it's inspired this one here, though it's not exactly the same. It's based on a real specimen that we know the colors of, so we have a pretty good idea of what at least one specimen or one species of Cetacosaurus kind of looked like. But I think this guy came out rather well, and look at these cute little babies! <laughs> so these little guys would probably have been living in um, like all sorts of different habitats, and the species Neomongoliensis was about the same size as Mongoliensis, which was about uh, 2 meters long and weighed about 20 to 40 kilograms. Uh, so not the hugest ones, but they would have become some large animals like Triceratops. And were herbivores or potentially omnivores, where they would kind of be like uh, living in um, these areas and kind of just eating whatever they can, or most likely herbivores, we believe. But um, as we have mentioned before, uh, it's not always so cut and dry with herbivore and carnival. There's always a spectrum to everything in nature. But yeah, really, really cute, cool guys. And look at these really, really cute little babies. I'm really happy these how these babies come out. Quite adorable. And you can see the big dad over here. Really, really beautiful uh, models, I think. So yeah, we have our second to last animal. So that was done by TNT. Our second to last one was done by Leaf. So we have got here the... Hoffman's three, uh, two-toed sloth, I was about to say three. <laughs> so these guys, like other sloths, they're kind of large, uh, not, no, normally uh, nocturnal and arboreal, and are found in mature uh, secondary rainforests and also uh, deciduous forests. And their name comes from the German naturalist Karl Hoffman. So that's where they get the Hoffman's two-toed sloth. So similar to other sloths, they're quite heavily built with shaggy fur and these slow movements, and they get their name the two-toed sloth because they only have... As you guessed it, two toes, technically, but it's actually their fingers. Should be the two-fingered sloth. Uh, so then you have two on these guys. And they're also, the main other ways you can see them is that they are a little bit larger than uh, three-toed sloths. And they also have absences of hair on sole on their feet. And they also have these different colorations here. They're much more um, brownish rather than the grayish that you see on the three-toed. Though they're actually much easier to conclude with the other species, the Linnaeus uh, two-toed sloth, which is quite closely related. But the primary way to turn those apart is like subtle differences, such as their uh, bones and things like that. But in terms of the field, they're a little bit harder to tell apart. But these guys can get quite big. Their general size is about 54 to 72 centimeters, or 21 to 28 inches long from head to tail, or head to body length. And they weigh about 12.1 to 9 kilograms of 4 to 19 pounds with quite stubby tails to get up to about 3 centimeters. And females are actually on larger than average than males, although they pretty much considerably overlap with size. And you can see their fur is tan with a light brown in color, but with being lighter on the face as you can see there. Oh, you might have a look at the other one because he's kind of facing the light and it might be able to help. Don't, don't do that. This really gives a good example. But they usually have a greenish tinge because, like other species of sloth, they have algae living in their fur, which helps them. So as I mentioned, they kind of live uh, in Central and South America. They typically live in forests and from sea level to 10,000 feet above sea level. And they're found in the Andes. Uh, one population also found in eastern Honduras. It's actually quite isolated populations, which is very interesting. And uh, the, there actually has been a divergence date of about 7 million years between their population. Could call them different species, but I won't do this yet. Uh, Two-toed sloth obviously live, being a sloth, they live in the canopies of these rainforests where they tend to uh, live in these trees and kind of just hang out and um, eat, from the tr uh, eat from the leaves, of course. They tend to stick to themselves. But they will come down uh, once a week for urination and def defecation. And they actually come to ground as well as they need to have new tree to live under and new food sources, but t generally they're up in the canopy minding their own business. <laughs> so in terms of behavior, they spend most of their time in the trees. So they may travel. Um, 
They're almost exclusively nocturnal, but there are locations that they're known to be active in the day. And it's also believed to be part of that competition with the bound-throated uh, sloth. That could be part of it. And they sleep for often about eight hours each night. Uh, and they often move very slowly, uh, like sloths do. And uh, they hang from these tree branches using these hook-like claws that they use to just hang out and uh, hang off. And typically, they actually will ground themselves, urinate, and change trees, as well as give birth. They give birth on the ground. And while typical locomotion, they kind of really look weird. They kind of just lie on the ground and kind of... Uh, move around and things like that uh, but they've actually been seen walking on their palms and um, soles as well and in terms of predators they typically are preyed upon by animals such as jaguars ocelots uh, anacondas margays and uh, harpy eagles mm -hmm. and if they to defend themselves they'll actually will slash at predators and use their huge claws and they will bite them and it's pretty pretty uh, actually pretty hard to uh, attack them because they're quite uh, they may be slow, but they can really hurt you with those claws and they can survive wounds that are pretty much fatal to other mammals their size and uh, Also the algae that live on them helps uh, camouflage them. So it's a way to hide themselves and We'll be talking in terms of courtship uh, the courtship kind of includes the males looking around to her genitalia and the male's body and gestation for these guys lasts quite a long time, about a year, from about 355 to 377 days. And a result of the birth of a single young uh, baby. And they're usually born at about 240, uh, 340 and 454 grams, or 12 to 16 ounces. And are considered pre so that means they're born pretty much helpless. So the mother needs to take care of them. They will take uh, and cling to their mother by the undersides. They will take solid food at about 15 to 27 days. And are fully weaned at about 9 weeks of age. Um, in captivity, they seem to be given birth upside down or attempting to pull the infants by the hind legs, but in the wild, they seem to be given birth on the ground. They reach sexual maturity at about uh, two to four years of age. There have been reports of them living up to 43 years in captivity, so they're quite a long-lived animal. So, through uh, two-trode sloths, they usually eat like fruits and flowers, but the most of their diet consists of tree leaves. Although they're not true ruminants, they actually have a three-chambered stomach. And the first two chapters, uh, chambers of the stomach hold uh, symbiotic bacteria that help them digest the cellulose in these plants. And actually makes takes them about a month to fully digest the meal. And up to two-thirds of a sloth's body weight may actually just be stuff in its digestive system. Uh, in terms of their conservation status, they are um, typically found in decrease, but there's little data on that. But I believe they are considered uh, least concerns. There's not too much... To worry about but also deforestation and stuff is a big issue and in terms of adaption they actually are heter um, heterothermic which means they uh, whatever environment they're in they'll learn to adapt so their body Celsius uh, body temperature is typically about 86 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or about 30 34 degrees Celsius which is two mammals actually pretty cool but having these cool temperatures allows them to save energy because they spend so much time just digesting. It's really hard for them to kind of uh, move around so much. They kind of conserve the energy, it's similar to koalas. They just slow it down, just mm. digest and use as little energy as possible because oh, yeah. it's very hard to digest plants like this. And it also oh, benefits yeah. them by also being able to grow this algae for camouflage and be able to live life on the slow lane. And it does a really good job for them. And they're also... Um, these hairs also allow them to uh, have, uh, when it's raining, they can ha allow the water to run off their bodies and not get stuck on them so it doesn't cool them down. Because getting uh, waterlogged can be a pretty, pretty big issue because it rains a lot down there. But yeah, these are really, really cool little guys. And in terms of like uh, going back to their babies, around the first six to nine months of birth, the mother sloth will carry them around on their stomachs. And they reach sexual maturity, as I mentioned, about three or four years old. That's when they start breeding on their own. And they typically carry the baby for about 11 and a half months, or about 12 months, about a year. So yeah, really, really cool guys here. Hoffman's uh, two-toed sloth. Uh, done by the leaf, as I mentioned. And last, but most definitely not least, we've got a really cool endangered animal. Also done by Noah Waller. We have got the Iberian lynx. A really, really cool animal here. So the Iberian lynx is a wildcat endemic to the Iberian Peninsula and is listed as endangered. 
And during the 20th century, their populations have been greatly hit by overhunting, poaching, and uh, frag habitat fragmentation. But another big issue has been uh, decline in their populations of their prey species, such as the European rabbit, which has been purposely controlled by humans, uh, by mix of mitosis and um, rabbit um, hemophagic disease. Uh, and in the turn of the 21st century, they were really on the verge of extinction. It was believed to be only 94 individuals left in two isolated populations. And lots of conservation me uh, measures have been taken, such as improving the habitat, restocking of rabbits, translocations and reintroductions, and also captive breeding. Their populations have increased from 326 individuals to 1,111 individuals in 2021. So that's really, really awesome. So these guys are actually quite small compared to a lot of the other ones. They have this bright yellowish tawny coat and their range, as you can see these spots down them. They have these really, really cool gels as well uh, with these ruffs and really gives them a unique look. And um, in terms of their size, the head to body length for males is about 74 to 82 centimeters uh, or 29 to 32 inches with females being a little smaller at about um, 68 to 77.5 centimeters or 29 to 30 inches, 26 to 30 inches. And the males typically weigh between 7 and 15 kilograms, or even up to 16 kilograms. And females live, uh, weigh between 9 and 10 kilograms. So they are not quite as big as your normal lengths, but they are kind of isolated in those populations. But they typically feed on rabbits. So they're typically found all across the Iberian Peninsula and southern France. Uh, throughout the 1950s, their population extended from the Mediterranean to northern parts of Portugal to southern parts of Spain, Spain. But of course, as their populations kind of went down and down, they became very restricted in a lot of areas. And um, mm. similar to other uh, cats, they will mark their territories with urine, uh, scratch marks and scats and things like that. And the home ranges typically uh, are about 5.2 to 6 kilometers or 2 to 2.5 square miles for females or six females and four males typically have a home range of four, 11 to 12 or 4.6 to 4.7 miles so about 12 kilometers really so in terms of diet and hunting their main pretty much 90 percent of their diet comes from european rabbits which is obviously very heavily hit by um the crashes of populations from rabbit hemomorphic disease and myxomitosis. but they also eat lots of rodents uh red-legged partridges young fallow deer, roe deer, mouflon, ducks, and uh, a lot of those things. And they also uh, competes with prey from red foxes, Egyptian mongooses, uh, European wildcats, and Iberian wolves. And they often even been seen killing smaller carnivals such as uh, red foxes, uh, Egyptian mongooses, and common genets. So in terms of reproduction, during the mating season, the female will leave her territory for another male. See if you can find the female over here. What's she doing? She's kind of having a little dance over there. Really, really beautiful model though. A typical gestation period for this mother is about two months with their little kittens, as you can see here, little kitten. Typically born about March and September with the peaks of birds uh, around March and April. Um, the litter consists of about two to three, really one or four or five babies that weigh between 200 to 250 grams. As they grow up, these babies will become independent at about 7 to 10 months old, but they remain with their mother for about 20, uh, 20 months. Survival of the young depends on prey availability, of course, and the wild, they mo typically reach uh, sexual maturity about a year old, but they really breed until there's a territory vacant. And they've actually been known to not breed until 5 years old when its mother died, So, and their maximum longevity in the wild is about 13 years. And siblings can often become violent each other between 60 and 30 days, which peaks about 35 days. And a kitten will actually frequently kill its litter mate in these brutal fights. And we don't know why it uh, happens like that, but it could be just like survival of fetish or a change in hormones. But we don't really know. But um, in terms of their conservation, we'll go back to the female while she's sitting there and have a look at her in the wonderful light. But um, in terms of conservation, they're really threatened by road accidents now, uh, habitat loss and... Uh, illegal hunting though there have been lots of improvements as we see the population has dramatically increased from basically from the turn of the century 94 to over a thousand or 1100 technically there's lots of illegal traps that have been set for uh lynxes as well uh, in 2013 14 lynxes were killed in rows in 2013 in 2014 about 21 
Also, several individuals have died from disease, such as feline leukemia and also some right other on. antibiotic resistant bacteria. But in terms of their conservation, it really isn't hurting them too much, and there's lots of uh, re uh, programs in place to try and help these animals. Uh, in terms of conservation, uh, they're considered CITES Appendix 1, and they're considered endangered by the IUCN. And in terms of their reproduction, uh, reintroduction programs have been introduced to a lot of areas uh, that are like, safe for them, including places such as Guandamelo, I believe. There was a population that was about 23 in 2013. And since 2010, the, the species have been restricted to these areas, but there have been all sorts of different um, reintroductions to different areas across uh, Iberia, so around Portugal and Spain, where they have been reintroducing these guys to try and mix and match populations to get the best genetic diversity out of them. And also, there have been pretty intensive captive breeding programs uh, I believe there's been uh, about 14 kittens that survived in 2008 and 15 in 2019. Uh, in 2017, the total population of Iberian lynx reached 275 specimens, and in February 19, that was about 250. 650, I mean. So uh, I believe the amount of uh, places that have... Uh, there's a couple places like the Iberian lynx breeding center, uh, which is in, I believe... Uh, it's called uh, Portugal. It's called Nacional de Reproducto de Lince Libera, which is a breeding center that's in Portugal, which has nurtured uh, a little over 120 species of, um, not species, individuals of uh, lynx that have, uh, and released about 73 of them into the wild. So that's also really, really cool. So these guys are luckily on the up and up and um, a really good conservation success story, but they're not out of the woods yet but they are well on their way to recovery. There is still issues such as habitat destruction, uh, a potential crash in populations of rabbits could particularly hurt them, and uh, things like that, but they look like they're doing rather well. So we'll have a look at this cute little baby. Now, Walla really does a wonderful job with these guys here. But, yeah, I think this will be a perfect place to end the episode. So, yeah, I um, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this uh, video. I hope you guys liked and subscribed. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified or upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye